Hey everybody, it's Todd Dills here, your host for Overdrive Radio. Before we get started with the meat of this week's episode, I wanted to put in your mind a live online session that we have upcoming that I think any owner-operator can contribute to and glean quite a lot from. It's on the topic of, most broadly, how to build an owner-operator or small fleet business to survive and thrive in tough economic times, as so many have experienced in the last couple of years' worth of softening freight markets post-COVID. A big part of it, no doubt, will center on how to build business as insurance, so to speak, against the boom and bust cycles that have been part of trucking's ups and downs for decades. Featured speakers include a past overdrive small fleet champ with a solid business in a 30-plus truck fleet and our resident owner-operator coach, Gary Books. Likewise, a one-truck carrier who's living that mission implied by this topic. It'll be roundtable style, moderated by yours truly, with Q&A opportunity for anyone attending live. That's coming up August 22nd, 1 p.m. Central. You can register for it via overdriveonline.com slash PIB. And I'll put a link to that registration page in the show notes for this episode, too. Now, on to this week's podcast. More today from my run with Josh Gentry almost two weeks back now. Gentry is the son of country music titan, Alabama's founding member and bassist, Teddy Gentry. And today on the podcast, we'll dive into the history of the band with some of the hands at its headquarters in Fort Payne, Alabama, around which all three founding members, Gentry, lead vocalist Randy Owen, and the late guitarist Jeff Cook, all grew up there and kept ties to the place over all the years of chart toppers, touring, and all the trucking involved with the operation. The Kenworth Company is sponsoring Alabama's current tour, the Roll On 2 North American Tour, using the name of its trucking song classic, Roll On 18 Wheeler. As noted in the prior, first part of this two-part podcast with trucker Josh Gentry, Kenworth's sponsorship rekindles an old relationship between the band and the truck company. Founding member Teddy Gentry called the original relationship a product of necessity back during the height of the band's popularity, when he said the tour was supported by as many as five tractor trailers full to the gills with the equipment the band's operation toted from place to place in Kenworth. He can't recall just how it started, but, quote, we needed trucks and we were exploding on the scene as far as the music goes, he said. Teddy Gentry called it certainly a quote-unquote good promotion for them, too with Alabama trailers festooned with band insignia pulled across North America by Kenworth trucks. It was good for the band, too, he said, and led to the band featuring at the Mid-America Trucking Show nearly every year through the late 1980s up through an official farewell tour in the early 2000s. This rekindled current sponsorship, Gentry added, has been great to, quote, reunite a relationship that works, and especially that my son's now involved, he said. For Josh Gentry, his father felt. Trucking with the band and family is, quote, a dream come true. Josh's own words underscore that to an extent for sure. As he reflected during our run in the single 2021 Kenworth T680 that now powers the Alabama controlled portion of the tour today. Like so many an owner operator and driver the nation over, Gentry takes pride in doing what he does. There's a big thing to these guys that do this week in, week out, and they they, you can tell they take pride in their equipment and they want to show it off and they want people to know that they're happy doing what they do. So I, I love it. I, I can't say, I, it's, it's a fun job to have. If you missed last week's podcast, you're going to hear Josh Gentry today speaking on the Thursday ahead of Alabama's Friday, July 19th show at the Bridgestone Arena in Nashville. The bulk of the talk was recorded in cab with Gentry on the hall up in Bering headquarters in Fort Payne. I also spoke with staff there about their longevity working for the group and memories of the past supporting their relationship with their fans and the many, many tours. I was in Myrtle Beach and Radio at the time, okay. WKZQ FM in Myrtle Beach. We were a top 40 FM station there, and uh, the guys were playing at the Bowery. Right. We've got some of the most loyal fans that have ever walked God's earth. They're just as down to earth as we are, and we become family. After the first or one or two big jams or fanfares, I mean fan appreciation days, yeah, 
It didn't it's matter just, if it was a state fair and we were outside or in an arena and they'd be wrapped around the, the arena and they'd do it until the last person left, man. And I think, I think that in a lot of ways, in a major way, attributed to their success and their relationship with the fans. And we'll drop in at the load site in Nashville where Alabama's gear is housed and where Josh Gentry hauled into to fill up the wrapped 48-foot Great Dane show trailer to stage that Thursday night at Bridgestone. Tour operations managers there spoke to all manner of aspects of Josh Gentry's and their own work for the band, and the tight relationship between father and son, Gentry, as well. I was retired from the business, but it's Alabama. Do you say no to Alabama? No, you don't say no to Alabama. If they call, you say, yes, sir, great. Great drivers. Yeah, it seemed like... You rode with them up here, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Didn't scare you? Didn't scare me. Didn't scare me. <laughs> I kind of messed up and I said that. And Josh said, well, next time we talk about that, I'd say, him and whose army. <laughs> so they have that kind of a good, you know, playing back and forth relationship. After the break, a portrait of country music titans Alabama from the road. With Destination, a show that would see something that you don't see every day, that's sure. The show opened with a Kenworth video that, in essence, is a tribute to the importance of American trucking and ends with a message, in this case, sent out to 20,000 people all in a very, very big room. Thank you to drivers everywhere at Red. Roll on. Keep tuned. Every season is diesel season, so power up yours with Howes. Poor quality fuel can wreak havoc on your engine even in the warmer months. Protect your diesel with Howes diesel additives and lubricants. 100% alcohol free and made with the highest quality ingredients. Howes products will keep your diesel vehicles and equipment running strong all year long. Visit HowesProducts.com to find out which product you need today to keep your engine running like new tomorrow. Howes. Tested. Trusted. Guaranteed. Here's a big thanks to Howes for their continued support. Find a wealth of information about all their fuel treatments and many other lubricants and products via H-O-W-E-S, houseproducts.com. Here's General Manager Mary Jones at the Alabama Fan Club headquarters in Fort Payne, Alabama, reaching back in memory to the very founding of the fan club, moving into the location where the Kenworth T680 tour truck is housed when it's not on the road, much more besides. Moved to this building in 1985. Okay. Mm -hmm. And before that, what, what was it? It, it, We just had smaller buildings, and this was originally a Chevrolet dealership. Okay. And when it closed, it closed in 82. And once it closed, this building stayed vacant for a couple of years, and then the band was really, yeah. really booming. And so they bought and remodeled, and we've been here ever since. That's cool. Yeah. And we redid the museum in 2018. Okay. I'm the manager of the okay. fan club. Manager mm -hmm. of the fan club. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you do a lot of everything. I do. <laughs> and in details, I haven't seen the museum yet. Oh, you need to. It's yeah. really, really nice. Uh, there's the fan club area that have the t-shirts and the caps and that kind of thing. Okay. And then the museum's on the other side. On the way then with Josh Gentry toward the Alabama Museum, Gentry introduced me to Karen Ann Potts, also with decades of experience working with the band. I do 99% uh, of the shipping and receiving. Uh, in my older age, I don't unload trucks anymore. I did 37 years ago. Uh, and along with Jesse, we managed the database for the fans. Jesse is Josh Gentry's younger cousin, who was on hand that day in the office with Karen Ann Potts. Todd, you be safe on the road. We'll do it. Welcome to the funny farm. <laughs> we'll hear more from Karen, no doubt. Inside the museum at Alabama Fan Club headquarters, a principal attraction for me, outside a, a lot of the old guitars from Jeff Cook's collection, is a 1974 Dodge van that the band toured with in its early days, when it was called Wild Country. I asked Teddy Gentry for any recollections of those days, and the van in particular. The primary thing he remembered changing the oil religiously every 2,000 miles. We were using Kindle oil, he said, and that van was the band's livelihood. Everything depended on it. They've come a long way since then, for sure. For Josh Gentry, the museum stands as physical testament to much of his own history, 
fully intertwined as it is with that of the band. It's me and my sister with mom and dad. Yeah, yeah. And me, and yeah. then there's me, dad, mom, and my sister. And then my oh. pop uh -huh. That's a bigger picture of them behind me. They're still on the, on the farms they grew up on. You too, huh? Yeah. That's my grump yet. I bought it from Mark, their, their drummer, in 04? No. Oh, 05. Gentry referred there to drummer Mark Herndon, part of Alabama up through the early I 2000s. It from him in 05, and I've just held on to it for sentimental value because it was his. And um, I, when they redid the museum, I asked Dad, I was like, Dad, I was like, that drum kit was Mark's. I was like, do you want me to um, bring it down and, and put it on display? And he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, that'd be great. So, so I went to the sign shop and that was their original band name is deuces wild and then wild country was their next name and then they went to alabama and then um just for like sentimental value and and the fact of of the fact that it's i mean it was a part of their yeah. lineage because that was the kit he used on the 03 farewell tour and okay. and i used to at all the shows years ago I, when i was a kid i'd i'd sit I'd sit behind Mark and watch him play. At a lot of those shows, according to Gentry, it was former radio DJ Greg Fowler who brought the band out on stage and introduced him. Fowler hails from Low Country, South Carolina, and he's worked with Alabama for decades off and on through the years. Today, he's centered at the fan club operation in Fort Payne. I was in Myrtle Beach and radio at the time. Okay. WKZQ FM in Myrtle Beach. We were a top 40 FM station there. And uh, the guys were playing at the Bowery. Right. Alabama was the house band at the Bowery in Myrtle Beach for years before they really took off after a record contract with RCA in 1980. And uh, we were, we weren't a country station, but they weren't necessarily a country band either. Right. Not in that sense of the word. I mean, they were, but I mean, they played. They, Teddy Gentry said, they played everything from A to Z, A cuff to Z Z top. So. <laughs> right. Right. That covered that, but that's how I met them, and uh, we kind of worked together, and um, I say worked together, we promoted them on some events and stuff we were doing there sure. locally, and then when they finally got signed, became friends, and then when they finally got signed, finally, uh, to RCA in 80, 1980, they went on the road, and uh, Teddy gave me a call uh, one afternoon and asked me, after they'd already been on the road for a year, wow. And asked me if I'd like to come to work with the guys, and I said, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> so I moved from Shirley and I, my wife, and uh, Jonathan, our son, youngest son, moved to Fort Payne, Alabama, from Myrtle Beach, and and uh, I just started from the ground up. Right. And I didn't. We we established our headquarters here. Nashville had their management offices. Just uh, at the time and still sure. do for that matter but that's how it grew man and I, I was publicity promotions yeah. media relations um, travel with them everywhere they went I was there right. whether it was on a bus or a plane whatever and uh, end up end up writing a number of songs with the guys cool, and, uh, just one thing led to another and uh, was involved in every pretty much every aspect of the touring that they were a part of because when they left i left you know i was on the bus i'm on the bus with them they're gonna fly they're flying with them and right. tour manager acting i guess day-to-day -day manager on the road gotcha. um and we're not big i've said this before we're not real big on titles around here sure. so whatever the job entailed i uh and and i was asked to to do something that's what i did but a lot of trucking involved in that i'm sure there was we, <laughs> yeah 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 um we had a good great relationship at the time not at that time but it developed at later years later with kenworth and yeah. uh that was a tremendous relate and now today we continue that relationship but right. uh I, yeah i was involved in just about everything i was not was not the production manager okay. at the time that was Brent Barrett an, an amazing soul great friend of mine and uh, he was Alabama's production manager he handled all that man yeah, all the nuts awesome. and bolts somebody David Pascal uh, also a later would be a 
production manager for Alabama, and David worked with uh, Big and Rich and uh, okay. some others too. But he told me, man, he said, here's the deal. He said, if it plugs in or turns on, that's a production manager. If it involves the artist and anything else, that would be the tour manager. But I said, all right, got it. Well, I don't mess with stuff that plugs in or turns on. I can tell you that. But, but that's how it all evolved. And then we farewelled in 2004, I guess it was, 2004, five, somewhere in there. Farewell tour. And we did. We didn't do anything forever. And then I, uh, at that same time, had an opportunity, because I wasn't doing anything either, to uh, go to work with them. Uh, a young artist, Jake Owen, no relation to Randy, but uh, so I was with Jake for 13 years okay. and and then went through that whole deal with him and and, uh, and then in 2019, I came back and we, well, COVID hit into that 2020, yeah. that shut everything down, dude. It was like, yeah. there ain't no, there's nothing going on in the entertainment or anywhere else, but yeah. for sure in the entertainment business. And, uh, and so anyway, in uh, 2021, I was uh, asked if I'd maybe like to come back and work with the guys. And yeah. so uh, starting on January, the, I think January 1, 2022, yeah. I have to keep up these dates now, man. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So back for now, the third year, I've been back again and That's cool. working with them in a different setting on the, on the in the office now. And yeah. I'm not on the road anymore. Okay. And um, dealing with June Jam, uh, our annual June Jam concert, that's my big responsibility. Also, yeah. the the museum and and uh, so forth well, there's a lot of stuff like that museum man yeah. that's uh it's worth checking out for there's a history. yeah and it, it, it's history there man yeah. it's, it's like all those awards you see these artists scooping up on tv and yeah. so forth and uh, so you saw that raft of all those pictures yeah. it, when i took every one of those <laughs> yeah. and i took them on the road it was yeah. these are all pictures shooting up actually had a uh, a Minolta and then a Nikon, yeah. not a Minolta, but a, yeah, a Minolta uh, camera, but I was shot on film and I shot everything that, that just, someone would come up and I'd take a picture of it. It wasn't like, stand here, let's get a picture. It was like, it was like just stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so every, I, and again, that's part of the, the sequence of just memories and being on the sure. road, man. Yeah. And so I can go into every, I'll tell you what every one of those things meant, where they were taken, when, what happened. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's just easy when you're out. The wall of pictures Greg Fowler is referring to here is pretty much the first thing you see when you walk into the museum at the fan club headquarters. Josh Gendry and I had just spent some time next to it, and he was absolutely 100% correct when he said this about it. I happened to catch Greg Fowler there for an impromptu tour through the memories and the stories of those days gone by. Well, it might be the most enjoyable two to three days you ever spent, I'd wager. Man, we did all kinds of stuff, dude. We set up press conference. It was like Meet the Beatles. We, we There was such a demand for their time. Sure. It, it was incredible. We would... We would go, we stayed in hotels. So when you went, let's say we stayed in whatever, you know, Sheraton and Little Rock. I'm yeah. just taking that for an example. We in advance, because well, we're getting so many requests from me. Well, we need to like, meet, get an interview. And we were doing a lot of advanced stuff too yeah. when we were home or even on the road. Yeah. At four o'clock, man, every afternoon, at Sunday, didn't matter, Monday, whenever we're playing, we go in there, I have a conference room. There, we'd invite all the media. Everybody come in all They'd the sit yeah. right there at the table, all four of them, Randy, Teddy, Jeb, and Mark, man. Yeah. And, and we TV, newspaper, and it, it right. provided an opportunity. And it was always the day of the concert. So it was the sure. afternoon before, before sound checks and any of that stuff. Right. And so all these media outlets, got they got everything they needed for sure. their for their stories, their newspaper stories. Yeah. The radio guys had all the recorders up there, so they, had, they got all that. Then they do liners and so forth. And then, of course, we go and do the show and whatever. But the main the thing that really was the most impressive and the t most, honestly, the, the most lab laborious was after every single show, they would sign autographs. Not like, okay, not just fan club members or whatever, sure. you know, VIP or meet and greet. But now, we do that. We did most of our radio stuff and 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 so forth contest winners in the afternoon right. when we we did the press conference thing. 
But then they would sign autographs for the fans, and man, they would sign until the last person awesome. left. Yeah, wow. And we would have Dedication. hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah. It didn't matter if it was a state fair. And we were outside or yeah. in an arena, and they'd be wrapped around the, the arena. And they'd do it until the last person left, man. And I think, I think that in a lot of ways, in a major way, attributed to their success and their relationship yeah. with the fans. And nobody did and nobody was really doing yeah, that. That's a, the, <laughs> the trucks would load because we were carrying full production. I mean everything. Load out, load up, load gone and we'd still pull on, and they're still there, man. <laughs> There'll be another maybe two hundred people there waiting. We've got some of the most loyal fans. That's Karen Ann Potts again. That have ever walked God's earth. They're just as down to earth as we are, and we become family. Right. After the first or one or two big jams or fan fairs, I mean fan appreciation days, yeah, it's just yep. family reunion. Right, and they do the June jam here down yes. here still. Yeah, down at uh, the VFW fairgrounds. Okay. Uh, okay, this year we had a beauty contest. A parade. Uh, Randy had a golf tournament. Okay. Uh, Teddy did the teenage talent search. Uh, Jeff's wife had a brunch okay. out at the castle, and uh, she also had just a, a kind of like dinner and uh, auction right. the night before. Uh, then we did Songwriter Showcase okay. on Friday. If you ever get a chance, that's the show to come see. Okay. And that's and all it, happening around here? And... Every bit of it's here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we do jam on, yeah. on Saturday. Yeah, you get an Alabama sunburn. <laughs> <laughs> Out on the road later that day toward Nashville, trucker Josh Gentry contrasted the days of old. When, as his dad told me later, Alabama might be convoying with five Kenworth tractors pulling trailers loaded with every piece of the show operation. Lighting, sound, stage setup, the band's gear, everything. Contrast that to the one truck that he pilots today. The band reliant on partner companies for a good bit of the equipment, other than their gear in the 48-foot Great Dane Gentry's pulling. Most of the time, like all their, their lighting and their, their uh, local is, most of the time it's local, sometimes their promoter will outsource their, um, whether it be like light, lighting or sound or their digital wall or, yeah. or whatever, they'll outsource it to other companies. Some of them are local, some of them are not. They just It just depends on what ties the promoter has to the companies that they use. They've had multiple, um, multiple companies and avenues and channels, even if you will. Um, of companies that they use for for all of, all their needs. Yeah. So, in fact, when Josh Gentry first came full circle behind the wheel of the band's tour operation a couple of years ago, he was himself officially working for one of those companies, based in Chattanooga, and driving a box truck. First run that I went out with Alabama um, when I was driving the truck, the company in Chattanooga is called Harmonic uh, Concert Audio, and. Um, the first run that I went on was um, to Mississippi, and that was that was that was fun because I first got my first little taste of it was close, and it was it was an easy run, and that was when I first got the bug. I was like, okay, I'm I'm part of this now. So, or going from you know, driving a hopper bottom to to doing this, and on top of all of it, I mean, getting to go out and spend spend time with with dad and go do things with him and be a part of his world i mean which i always was and like we were always a part of of it growing up but for the most part we uh getting to do it in this in this context was just was just awesome we've gotten to hang out with each other in ways that we wouldn't have ever got to if had he not like i mean we'll go eat together some places and and I just, and we, Dad and I have a, we have a bond between us, and it's like we, it's like we know each other in a way that he knows me, and when we're out here and 
and like in a sense to where we like we just want to be around each other and and like we'll go whether it be something minor like go eat together or yep. like we may go they may be playing at a casino or something and like I'll go sit with him at a at a table or something like that just to just to hang out with him or whatever and he's a he's a pretty open book and he never he never shines anyone away that's that's the thing I respect for him is uh, I mean he's he's always open to meeting people saying hi to anybody who wants to say hi to him it's a good quality to have especially I mean like in this field of work I mean you gotta you gotta be a greeter Teddy Gentry's no doubt magnanimous returned my call within 10 minutes as I was putting this episode together, curious about his reflections on Josh being now squarely in this part of the family business. Mr. Gentry noted what might be obvious to any of you who heard the first episode from our run with his son last week, that, quote, it's been a dream of his to be a truck driver since he was but a little kid. Teddy Gentry recalled Josh would get angry if he was on the road with the band and they booked a hotel room that wasn't by the interstate. Why? He wanted to watch the trucks roll by from the windows, of course. Teddy and I talked last week Wednesday. He was on the road toward Columbus, Ohio, where he planned to meet his son for supper that night before the band was set to play the next day at the Ohio State Fair. From there, as Josh told me on the road to Nashville... Friday is a travel day. Work up down to Kentucky, uh, do a show. And then after Kentucky, we go up to Delaware and Virginia and then after those I forgot where all we go we go Wisconsin and go out west go to California and Nevada and Washington and got kind of a broad array but after after the west coast run it, it slows down uh, we finish out the year in November in uh, Fort Lauderdale Florida we were getting close to our destination as we spoke a sound check facility where the Great Dane trailer would be loaded with the band's stage gear and towed it on to Bridgestone Arena. Answer. Howdy do! I'm good, how are you? Okay. Okay. I, I will, I'll try to keep it PG for the... the there we audience. met Alabama tour manager Jeff Davis, who spoke to Josh Gentry's driving ability and more. I've, I've, we followed the truck a few times. I'm sitting in front of the bus just watching him and watching how he drove. And right. Great drivers. Yeah, it seemed like... Are you rode with him up here, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I Didn't scare you? Didn't scare me. <laughs> Didn't scare me. You know, it's more than just driving, though. You got to you got to help oh, yeah. with the trailer, and yeah. and you know, you know, trailer tr- drivers are responsible for everything in the trailer. You got to you got to know what you got to you got to inspect. You know, yep. uh, he had automatically worries about dock height because yeah. you know, it's really hard to load some of those big cases if the dock isn't level with the truck. Yeah. Road manager Bob Harr there is always worried about getting the ramps the right height, getting the right amount of air in the trailer. So it's easy you know, for the crew to get in and out. And he likes to have it perfectly in line. So it's you know not off at an angle where he might trip, fall, or drop something. So very conscientious. He cares. So, you know, that's the most important thing. Well, Jeff and I go back to somewhere in the early 80s. We actually don't know when we met back then. But we worked with uh, Randy Travis organization since, well, he has since really close to the beginning, Randy. And I have for... Is it really going on 30? Yes, it's 94. It's 30 years. Yeah. So we've known each other. And uh, he was on board, and he called me to ask me about the job. I was retired from the business, but it's Alabama. Do you say no to Alabama? No, you don't say no to Alabama. If they call, you say, yes, sir. Great. Anyway, anyway uh, I think I'll add what Bob was saying. Is yeah. The thing about Josh is he cares. Yeah. He takes great care of the equipment all the time. Yeah. It's natural. And what a great way to meet chicks when you have this big Alabama. The last voice was that of the jocular Dwayne Jones, stagehand and drum tech, fully involved in the load in process with Gentry, Davis, and Bob Horror. A joke there, mind you. Josh Gentry's in a committed relationship today. 
as we also talked about on the run that day. Happy as a clam as far as all that goes. It was relatively quick work of it that day, and the show was quite a thing to behold the following night. As noted up top, it's not every day that you get to see a tribute to truck drivers broadcast to 20,000 strong in quite a big room. Not all shows are as simple as this one, though. As Bob Harr noted about some of the outdoor locations that might be more akin to Gentry's hopper bottom days out in the fields in some he, ways. It's normal to him, but to me it's just awful. If you have these outdoor gigs and you've had this out in the middle of nowhere show and it's not a real road, it's a gravel road and then suddenly it's in a field where they put gravel on it. These things weigh a lot and they sink right in the mud if it's a rainy day. And there you are, you know, out in the middle of nowhere and it's a long way some of these places to get a tow truck. One of the things I said early on is one of my first conversations with Teddy Gentry. I went up to him and I didn't think at the time exactly what I was saying. It just came out because it was, it was real. But it came out and I said, you know, I know you've done 40 some odd number one hits and, you know, you're a producer, you're a player, and you're known all over the world, and all that's amazing, so that's great. I said, but that is not anything to me as much as how good of a father you are to this guy, Josh. That Because Josh was treating me so nice right out of the hole with respect. I'm an old guy, yeah. you know, and he was treating me respectfully. He was being helpful. He was being kind and not rude. That You know, that's another, yeah. nowadays that's not the norm. And it was funny, I told him that. He said, and it was funny, Teddy said, well, if that ever changes, you let me know and I'll whip his. <laughs> and I, and I, I told Josh, I kind of messed up and I said that. And Josh said, well, next time you talk to my dad, say him and whose army. <laughs> so they have that kind of a good, you know, playing back and forth relationship where they care about each other. The crew of four made quick work of the load process at Soundcheck. And after a couple miles worth of a run to stage at the Bridgestone Arena dock, the day was done for Gentry. Tour hauling brings its own challenges, for sure, but as Gentry emphasized in the last podcast, it can be more restful, certainly, than his prior trucking work ag hauling with a hopper bottom. He stays grounded, like the band, for plenty of hard work on the family farm, too, back around Fort Payne. Remember Karen Ann Potts at the fan club, as she noted in last week's podcast about founding members Teddy Gentry, Randy Owen, and the late Jeff Cook. The number one thing that has kept them, I believe, with all my heart. Grounded is they've never left the farm. Okay. Yeah. They're on the farms they were born on. Right. And it's hard to get a really big head when you get off the bus here and you go to the farm and you got cow hockey to get out of the barn. <laughs> right. Or chicken stuff or whatever. Yeah. Isn't it, Josh? I tell everybody, I say... Whenever I get home, that's when the real work starts. Yeah. <laughs> getting out and working on the farm, fixing fence, getting the, cows in. The bull yesterday. The Turns bull yesterday. Out. And what, what was happening there? So the bull was down and could not get back yeah. up. I was leaving to come uh, to get you in yeah. Nashville, and I was le- I left the farm. And looked. there's a field across the road from our farm, and there's a, a bull in the pasture that he's – He's in retirement, and he's sure. he's done his work and done his dues, and and uh, we're just kind of letting him live his life how he wants, and and uh, he's in the field by himself, and I look over when I'm leaving, and he's laying flat on his side with both of his legs or yeah. both sets of legs sticking straight out, and I went, that ain't good, and so I parked my car and walked over, and he had dug a hole. Uh, with his hoof where he was trying to get himself up and he couldn't get up and so it it took us uh, about an hour hour and a half to to get him flopped back up on his on his belly and he's I looked at him this morning when I left and he's cool as a cucumber (laughs) here's big thanks to Josh Teddy and Linda Gentry for their time on this one and to everyone you heard here, from Mary Jones, Karen Ann Potts, and Greg Fowler at the Alabama Fan Club headquarters in Fort Payne, to tour operations men Jeff Davis, Bob Horror, and Dwayne Jones. Thanks to the Kenworth Truck Company, too. Read a little more about the history of the Kenworth relationship with Alabama, dating back to the mid-late 1980s. Uh, to do that, pull up the post that houses this edition of Overdrive Radio for July 29th, 2024 at overdriveonline.com. As noted up top, too, 
Join us live August 22nd at 1 p.m. Central or register to catch the replay of an all-star roundtable about strategy and more tactical approaches to setting any owner-operator or small fleet business up to effectively weather down freight cycles like what we've been experiencing now for nearly two years as markets soften from COVID highs. Features 2021 small fleet champ and Silver Creek Transportation owner Jason Cowan out of Henderson, Kentucky. Likewise, Overdrive's resident contributor and owner-operator Gary Books, both of whom you've heard in the past here on the podcast. One voice you haven't? That'd be Chapel Hill, Tennessee-based Ilya Denisenko, hauling with authority as ICV Express and whose business was launched way down in the trough, as it were. How's he making? There's a lot of close playing that went into that move, that's certain. Find out how to register to join us live and or access the replay at overdriveonline.com slash PIB. That's our partners in business section. Again, overdriveonline.com slash PIB. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trucker. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with the acoustic guitar and other support of trucker songwriter Long Haul Paul Marhofer. The theme is Legend of the Snake Man by Marhofer. Featuring the guitar work of Travis, the Snake Man himself, Whammock, Terry Two Socks, Richardson on bass, keys by Tishomingo Jim Whitehead, and on drums, Andrew Marshall. The podcast is backed up further by Overdrive Zone social media coordinator Jasmine Campbell, news editor Matt Cole, executive editor Alex Lockie, and video editors Lawson Rudisil and Andrew Gwynn. We'll see you next time.